Thanks so much for um, asking me to come and, and participate. Um, so I'm going to talk about local excision. <clears throat> and as we think about local excision and, or the different treatments for rectal cancer, I think, um, you know, I like to think of it as being guided by these core principles. Whatever we do to treat colorectal cancer has to first be safe. We have to get our patient out of the operating room uh, and the patient has to be able to get back to their families. And once it, we achieve that priority, then we have to be effective in eradicating their cancer. So that's priority number two. But um, uh, obviously priority number one is that our treatment has to be safe. And then the third priority is whatever we do, as long as we're controlling the cancer, uh, then we, can, we should be thinking about all the different ways that we can improve the experience for the patient and preserve function. And I think of local excision sort of along, along those lines. When we think about... Um, when we think about surgery for rectal cancer, the standard of radical surgery, you know, there is morbidity associated with it and mortality. There's a, often a need for an ostomy. It may be temporary or it may be permanent, particularly for uh, distant, distal disease. There's bowel dysfunction. Two-thirds of patients who undergo low anterior resection have severe LARS. Um, there's sexual dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, and also concerns of anxiety, depression, self-image, all of which can come. Uh, with, uh, with major surgery. And so if there were a way to treat um, some of our patients in a, um, in a less invasive way that might affect some of these um, areas, then it may be worthwhile. And I think that's what was first considered um, at, uh, at St. Mark's. Um, this is actually um, an experience at St. Mark's from 1948 to 1962, kind of the earliest experience that I could find that sort of really paved the way to think about something less than a Miles procedure, essentially, for, um, for rectal cancer. And I see Dr. Goldberg nodding his head, so I think I must have gotten that one right. Um, so <clears throat> in this pathology review, and look at this, only 3% of the cases, and this is 2,300 cases, actually had tumor confined to the bowel wall. In other words, only 3% actually had essentially what could have been stage one disease, which is quite impressive. That's before the days of screening. And when the pathologists looked at um, these cases, there were 11% that had um, lymph node metastasis, essentially in T1. This is before TNM, but essentially what would be T1, 11% had lymph node metastases. And then among what would be T2, 12% um, had lymph node metastases. And it was based on that that, I think it was based on that, at St. Mark's they started doing local, local excisions, actually for colon cancer as well. So I assumed a patient got a laparotomy and got a little like a local excision. So, but um, obviously, the, the, the most applicable location was um, within the rectum. And you can see that there was still a fairly high rate of incomplete resection, this doubtfully complete category. And those were associated with poorer outcomes. Uh, but if you look at the ones that did get a complete resection, the recurrence rate was relatively low. And so I think this probably started the interest in local therapy. And now, since then, of course, you know, the question is, if we're only going to take out the bowel wall, what's going on in the mesorectum? And so the incidence of lymph node metastases in the published literature, this is actually a series from Singapore. It's a very large series by a former, um, I believe, a former fellow from this program. Um, and uh, um, uh, you can see that, that the T category has a big bearing on whether or not lymph nodes will be involved. And um, Brad Sklau was kind enough to provide me with this table yesterday um, where we can see that it's not just if it's T1 or not, the depth of penetration uh, within the submucosa also has bearing on the risk of lymph node metastases. And in fact, if you have deep penetration, you have up to a 40% risk of lymph node metastases. Um, so those patients with deep penetration behave more like T2 patients than they do like T1. And so these are all sort of different factors that we can consider. And it's these kinds of information that kind of led to uh, the criteria for local excision that we have today. So what are these criteria? It has to be accessible, right? So however you get to it, you have to be able to resect it. Um, and the definition of accessibility has changed today because back in the days when it was essentially a Fergie moon and a Sawyer retractor to today, which is quite different, I think the definition of accessibility has changed. 
Um, it should be low risk T1, so if we know uh, that it's a deeply penetrating, so it was maybe an EMR or ESD and it was an SM3, that probably is not a patient who should just undergo local excision, or at least that needs to be part of the discussion. Um, it should be clinically N0, and in the modern era, they should all have MRI, but endorectal ultrasound is probably relevant, low grade, no LVI, no perineural invasion, and then some relative criteria of circumference less than 30% and three centimeter diameter. Again, that kind of speaks back to the accessibility issue. Actually, some of these criteria date all the way back to the original series um, from St. Mark's, as it turns out. Uh, quite fascinating. Uh, but these are factors that have been associated with, um, with acceptability of local excision. And so if we meet those criteria, is local excision adequate? So this is some work that was done by one of my colleagues at MD Anderson, Nancy Yu, before um, when she was spending some time doing some research uh, in collaboration with the American College of Surgeons. And <clears throat> she looked at data from the National Cancer Database um, and this is data from the mid-90s, looking at patients who had undergone either local excision or standard uh, resection, so a radical resection, for T1 and T2 disease. And you can see here that if we look at the cumulative risk of local recurrence, so this is T1 with local excision and T1 with standard resection, it's considerably higher even in T1 disease that you're going to have a recurrence if you do local excision rather than radical resection. And it's uh, much uh, higher in um, T2 disease. And here we can look at the observed overall and disease-specific survival. But the point here being that there is a trade-off with local excision compared to radical resection that needs to be recognized. Um, it's a little difficult for me to come to the University of Minnesota and talk about local excision because so much of the work in, in, in local excision and colorectal surgery has come from this institution. Um, but as you can see, um, this similar findings as that NCDB study have been demonstrated. The University of Minnesota experience on the left, you can see that local excision for T1 uh, versus radical resection for T1. So this is local, this is radical, this is radical and local for T2, clearly unacceptable for T2, and again, the trade-off still exists for T1. This is experience from, I believe, Memorial, yeah, this is Memorial Sloan Kettering, same ob observation, transanal excision versus radical resection. This is, um, this is for the Norwegian cancer, erectile cancer group, same thing, T1 disease, local excision has a much higher risk uh, for recurrence um, than radical resection. So this trade-off has to be recognized. And why is this important? So this is a patient that I saw many, many years ago, relatively early in my experience. He had undergone a local excision and hadn't had adequate follow-up. And now when he presents to me, you can see the disease that he's got. The and the treatment for this actually um, was a pelvic exoneration with S3 level sacral amputation because the perineural invasion and the sacral in, uh, nerve in, in root, nerve root invasion was extending into the sacral bone. And so he actually had to have a relatively high sacral amputation to address this in a salvage manner. If he had, had he had radical resection up front, uh, then we might not be having this, con we might not be in this situation. Unfortunately, he has since developed lung medicine and has passed on, but um, that was perhaps five years after we had completed um, the salvage operation. So what, ha so what are the results of salvage surgery? Uh, following local recurrence. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, again, um, data from MD Anderson looking at, um, looking at long-term outcomes. And you can see these are patients whom we presume had stage one disease to have a 50% long-term survival is actually pretty poor outcome. And the same findings have been observed and reported certainly from here uh, and from other institutions around the country that when we try to salvage, and I think Charlie Friel published the Minnesota experience several years ago, when we try to salvage after recurrence, those patients do very poorly. And I think uh, Christine Jensen recently had this nice publication in DCNR. This is the visual abstract that comes from it, recognizing that even these T1 patients can develop recurrence and that we have to think about different ways of surveillance. We might not always see it only with proctoscopy. You all do a lot of endorectal ultrasound here, and that's been a method of, dete of detecting some of these recurrences. So clearly it's not just about a digital exam or simply an endoscopic exam. Uh, multimodal surveillance is necessary for these patients. So 
How much of this is because, as you saw from that St. Mark's experience, there were these doubtful, complete resections. How much of the, these are technical failures? Are there other ways that we can try to improve the outcome? You see in the middle, transanal endoscopic microsurgery. I, Oz Finney's done a ton of those operations here, and now many others uh, perhaps do them as well here. And then Tamas on the right. So um, Ger Ger Gerald Buis. In, uh, introduced um, TEM in the 80s, and then in, in 2010, Sam Atala first reported the TAMIS procedure using more conventional equipment. And there are a number of potential ad, um, advantages, um, including the fact that we get magnification, we have access to a more proximal rectum, uh, we can control the margins better with, um, with uh, more precision, and as a result, reduce the rate of margin positivity, but it's still challenging. It's non-articulating instruments um, resulting in a very steep learning curve. But when we look at comparative results of microsurgery or some kind of video-enhanced surgery versus traditional transanal excision, and one of the studies in this systematic review that, um, that uh, Des Winter and his group had, has conducted includes the series from Minnesota, I think that's the Christophoridis study, um, we can see that clearly margin negativity um, um, is um, much better with a uh, video-assisted or transanal endoscopic microsurgical or TEM or TAMIS, however approach you want to do it, less fragmentation. And this is, these are log scales. I mean, that's a tremendous effect size, actually. And if we look at um, the uh, rate of, or risk of recurrence, also considerably lower uh, with, with these sort of more modern approaches than traditional T, um, transanal excision. Um, there are very few studies that compare TAMIS to TEM, but TAMIS has an advantage of being more conventional equipment. It's faster to set up. I actually find it a lot easier, I think. Um, and, but it is relying on having in, proper insufflation equipment, and, uh, but it seems that the short-term results are comparable. So however we do it, either TAMIS, TEM, TEO, or TARS nowadays, um, perhaps those, would be, those are options that improve the outcomes. What about... What about expanding the indications for local excision? And I think Brad's going to talk about this a little bit later, so I won't, I won't spend too much time talking about it, just to introduce the concept. So we said it's only in the most favorable of the T1 patients where local excision is appropriate, but what about more advanced disease like T2? So all of you are familiar with ACASOG uh, Z6041, T2 and 0 patients undergoing chemo radiation, then local excision, with a 50% pathologic complete response rate and good disease control. This is the recently published data from the CART study. It's a very similar study from the Netherlands, looking at chemo radiation followed by local excision. Still an 11% local recurrence risk, but appears to be a potential strategy. So what is local excision in 2019? Well, if you have low risk, if it's very low in the rectum and, e and it's small and easily accessed, then transanal excision may be appropriate. Uh, but for all others, they should undergo TEM or TAMIS or one of those approaches. And for high risk disease uh, following chemo radiation, it should strictly be considered investigational. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Um, I, I fully appreciate your point about high risk T1. Um, being combined with local excision and neo, or, uh, chemo radiation adjuvantly being investigational. Um, I believe it's still part of the NCCN guidelines. How do you um, rectify those two, these well, two points? So, I mean, I think we're always having these discussions, right? So some of that's actually based on CLGB 8984, which was the study that looked at local excision followed by chemo radiation. I mean, I think that it is, it is, an, it is, it is one of the options um, where the outcomes we have to accept are not going to be as good as standard resection. And so um, I, would, I would say there, again, this is the, this is, um, we, we have in general, um, I think we can achieve a reasonable level of control. It's not going to be as good, and that has to be in the discussion. And I would say, I would also add the caveat that post-op radiation after local excision, actually, there isn't much data to say that that is effective. Uh, most of the data where we see that there may be a role for, radi for multimodal therapy and local excision is actually with preoperative uh, chemo radiation therapy. So that's something to, to also um, consider. George, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Just something to clarify. Early in our, in our series here, the majority of these ca cases were villous tumors. We were just, quote, taking them off. We were not going full thickness. Once we realized the mistake, then we extended the, 
uh, excision to include full thickness.